So, good evening. Thank you to everyone for joining us this evening for our Intensive Care Society webinar. Tonight's theme is um, Obstetric Critical Care. My name is Sarah Scott and I'm one of the ST5 Anaesthetic and Intensive Care trainees from the Northern Deanery. Tonight I'm joined by four excellent speakers who are going to cover some different aspects of looking after the obstetric patient who requires critical care. Our speakers tonight are Dr Audrey Quinn, who's a consultant obstetric anaesthetist at James Cook University Hospital in Middlesbrough, Dr Anita Banerjee, a consultant obstetric physician, acute physician and diabetes and endocrinology consultant at Guy's and St Thomas in London, Dr Katie Cranfield, a newly appointed consultant in anaesthesia and critical care at the RVI in Newcastle, who has an interest in maternal critical care, and Katie Scott, who's a senior pharmacist with an interest in maternal medicine, who works within women's services at Guy's and St Thomas in London. During the talk, if you have any questions for our speakers, please jot them down in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will address these questions at the conclusion of the fourth talk. So without any further delay, we'll start off with Dr. Audrey Quinn, who will talk to us about COVID-19 and pregnancy. Good evening, and thank you for inviting me to talk about COVID-19 and obstetrics. My name is Audrey Quinn, and I'm an obstetric anaesthetist at James Cook University Hospital in Middlesbrough. My intensive care colleagues have become famous recently with their photographs of the front line and also a daily blog by one of my consultant colleagues. And these photographs inspired me to do some paintings. This is one of our very busy intensive care registrar, and I'd like to pay tribute to them for all the, the work that they've done. The aims of this talk is to cover some literature and resources to give you a snapshot of how it felt to be in maternity in the pandemic, maternal and critical care interface and thinking ahead and working together now that we've got a little bit of a, a stopgap, hopefully not before the next pandemic or surge, but uh, certainly as things have calmed down. The early information came in like a tsunami and certainly this felt relevant. If we don't flatten the curve, there will be about 50 million COVID papers by the end of the year. The early papers from Wuhan and uh, in China, this report of 18 patients indicated that women were getting severe respiratory disease and it was also affecting their babies and we were very concerned about this. But as time went on and ICNARC came out, we recognised that uh, we weren't seeing huge numbers of patients coming through, albeit some were unwell. It's, it, used, it came to around 6% overall. The paper in the middle came from France and that was a large study of 33 French centres, again highlighting the respiratory, severe respiratory distress and the fact that comorbidities are a big problem if the patients have them and that they should certainly be shielding. Um, I'd just point you to the USOG, USOG webinar resource there down in the right hand side which is particularly good, Beverly Hunt talking about thrombosis which of course is very relevant for us and in the middle I'm going to talk a bit more about the BMJ paper that came out in May uh, based on the UCOS survey system from all our maternity units and uh, a bit more detail on that uh, shortly. The problem, of course, with the tip pregnancy is that uh, although pregnant women are not thought to be more susceptible to the infection, the changes to the immune system can make them more vulnerable to severe infection. And we saw that with some of the previous uh, viruses, the SARS, MERS and the H1N1 epidemic in 2009 in particular. Um, seeing papers from the early part of the pandemic, though, we were able to, in March, come to the conclusion, both colleges, that uh, actually the COVID-19 itself wasn't a reason to deliver a baby and that actually we could go back to determining the de early de iatrogenic deliveries by OBS indication and not to routine separation, which was to know at the, the, the beginning. The RCOG resources, uh, three resources of note, coronavirus infection and pregnancy general guidance, maternal medicine services is a very useful document and also uh, occupational health advice. The paper below from New York State, Sutton, identified 13.5% asymptomatic carriage rate in their obstetric patients. And this was obviously a concern for us managing them. And it felt the same uh, where we were coming from. The UCOS paper I mentioned um, earlier from uh, came out in, in May is uh, an important resource for us to clarify what was actually happening. We saw 427 deliveries in this report. 56% were BAME, 69% overweight or obese, 
41% aged over 35, 34% comorbidities as we thought, 73% giving birth at term, 41 of them required extra respiratory support, 18 of the vent on ventilators and 4 had ECMO. Five patients died, three directly from COVID-19 and the other two from comorbidities and 12 babies were um, positive for COVID, uh, six in the first 12 hours after birth and how this vertical transmission occurred is still unclear whether it was placental, birth canal or in breast milk. Here are another couple of colleagues. Uh, Isabel Gonzalez is working very hard with us in uh, the maternal, enhanced maternal care unit and uh, doing our audit and helping us with training the midwives. And there is Richard Cree with his blog, There Are No More Surgeons, which some of you might have, might have heard of. Um, what was happening in critical care? Well, actually, we had a talk from the, the CD, Michelle Carey and Friday, and Middlesbrough was hit particularly hard, having twice the number of cases from the, the regional centre, 874, 104 critical care, 51 ventilated and 24 patients prone for a very long time. The critical care outreach referral slide was uh, particularly impressive, looking at the daily referrals, and you can see in April uh, shot, shot up to 60 per day. Um, and delivery suite, we were having the usual uh, patients' entries coming in. We couldn't do anything about that. Five and a half thousand deliveries a year, so it's a moderate size unit. Uh, very early on, we had great vi virology s support and all the elective cases were swabbed 24 hours pre-op. Very quickly after that, the inductions, and this was before lockdown, and actually now all admissions, and we use one-hour one tests for emergencies. So this has aided us greatly in, in managing these patients. Phone consultations became the norm, early shielding. Uh, the patients were great at doing this. They didn't want to come into hospital. Uh, there was a little bit of an issue with partners and we let them come in for birth, uh, the birth only. Well, some units didn't let them come in at all, so we felt it was a good compromise. <clears throat> 15 cases overall. Uh, the patients presented largely with fever, cough, headache, although there are some unusual presentations. One went to the COVID ward at 26 weeks with also a UTI. And this was something that was highlighted early that we were actually at risk of missing the ordinary common things in obstetrics of chorea amnionitis. Uh, one woman sadly had a had a um, eclamptic fit at home because she was complaining of headache and not, not admitted. We had no level three admissions. Um, eight of our staff were referred to Oki Health because as I say, the, the asymptomatic carriage was, was high and I think this had an impact. Um, and the anaesthetic cover for delivery suite came from our COVID rota. So the general anaesthetists were, were drafted in for that and we had to be pretty slick with our um, protocols and guidelines. So this is how it felt in the in the first month, certainly, uh, trying to uh, process all the policy changes and making guidelines and SPs. We adhered to the uh, college hub guidelines and the, the traffic lights were very useful. In obstetrics, uh, we did a, we, a lot of our work doesn't require um, full PPE, obviously, labour epidural. But if we were taking the lady into cesare to cesarean delivery, we were uh, the anaesthetists were wearing FFP3 masks if we felt there was a, a reasonable risk of conversion. And of course, general anaesthesia being an AGP had the highest risk there. In terms of management, uh, we had SOPs coming out our ears for theatres and for our neuraxial techniques. We were trying to encourage patients to have early epidurals to avoid doing general anaesthetics. Um, we had EMC guidelines quite early on and uh, we had a, an outreach pathway, although we weren't getting many replies to our phone calls and emails, particularly in April, as you, as you can imagine. Um, we had daily meetings across specialty, which were, were uh, taxing to say the least, but very, very productive. As you know, thromboprophylaxis was a big area of concern and the guidelines came out quite early for, for the patients antenatally and postnatally, right up to six weeks. Um, D-dimers aren't particularly useful in obstetrics, but they certainly are useful in the prognostic COVID uh, situation. High fibrinogen is a high, uh, hallmark of this. Microthrombosis in the lungs, and many of them required a CTPA. Level 3 case series indicate severe single organ disease. Prolonged ventilation uh, is, is, is happening, patients two to three weeks and longer and proning both pregnant and non-pregnant, but mostly patients are del delivering because they're presenting in the third trimester. Cytokine storm seems to be less likely, and, and most patients, uh, there's a high rate of full recovery compared to non-pregnant for mother and baby, although there seems to be a high risk of delirium and thromboembolism. Remdesivir, steroids, all of these things relevant for pregnancy, and certainly a feeling that in preg pregnancy studies need to be 
to be done. The, don't exclude our pregnant women unless you have to. Information for for us uh, obstetricians, the OAA resources were fantastic. We had a WhatsApp group which was very useful of all the obstetric leads, and here is a on the right hand side is a really good um, guide for uh, enhanced maternal care or maternal critical care from Birmingham, looking at what's happened, what would, useful advice for on the delivery suite as well as uh, on intensive care. So this takes me on to the the interface. Uh, obviously, early warning scores are essential, and um, you'll probably have heard me harping on about the fact we don't have a national one yet. And the left-hand slide shows all the different thresholds we're using. Um, this has been highlighted in the, the standards drop up on the left-hand side. The Irish and the, Gla the Scottish have uh, are ahead of the game here, but I have some good news to, to say that last Friday I had an email t saying that there's a, um, a group forming for uh, the national early warning score in the UK, in England for 2021. So that should help get to uh, get our um, pathways uh, and hopefully links with intensive care up and running better. Because this certainly is a problem getting uh, the interface between critical care outreach and obstetric physicians um, really sorted and, and flowing well and, and for each for each hospital with all the, nobody has a particular model that works for everyone. So we have to talk to each other to sort it out. I think it's going to be an interesting uh, winter uh, and autumn. We're going to head into the ninth month shortly anyway, um, but uh, these women uh, don't seem to be getting any small. Um, so in terms of what we do, a lot of it is in this enhanced care doc, which came out in Mar in May. It's, uh, and uh, there's a position statement from Scotland that's useful to, to give us more ideas. We need to look at networks and collaborative and teaching and training. Uh, the critical care nurses have got their competencies running. They're teaching midwives in Yorkshire and Humber. And we've got a really good uh, podcast, video podcast resource if anyone wants with multidisciplinary training uh, across the board. Our world has gone upside down. Um, these are pandemic babies in North Italy. Uh, but in obstetrics, of course, things the show had to go on um, and it was an incredible time for us all. Uh, as you can see, this poor dad's watching the birth of his baby on a, an iPad. I've just put the uh, frontispiece from the United Nations document published in May and I've reported on the um, problems of COVID in, in the Western world. But of course, uh, the, um, the situation in the developing world is absolutely catastrophic, particularly for mothers and babies. And our last slide is to just finish off with enhanced care quote. Um, the world has changed due to COVID-19 and we may have some way to go before this pandemic is truly subsiding. But an appropriate legacy would be for cooperative working across hospital specialties to be retained. This would be a positive outcome for a national emergency. Uh, thank you for listening. And I've been told I have to uh, introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Anita Banerjee from obstetric physician from uh, Great Ormond's uh, Guys in St Thomas's Hospital. She's going to talk about preeclampsia and uh, liver disease in pregnancy. Thank you for listening. Good evening. I would like to thank the organisers today for inviting me to speak. Obstetric patients on the critical care unit can always be challenging. Today, I will discuss acute fatty liver pregnancy in the critical care setting. I will with a case of a 26 year old in her first pregnancy who presented at 35 weeks gestation with a 10 day history of nausea, vomiting and anorexia. On examination, she appeared to be jaundiced. Her investigations found her to have a haemoglobin of 127, which is raised in pregnancy as usually there is a dilutional anemia. Her platelets were low at 121. Her white cell count was raised. Her CRP was raised at 21. Usually this is less than five in pregnancy. She had an acute kidney injury with a creatinine of 199. In the third trimester, the creatinine usually is 77 micromoles per litre. Her sodium was low, her potassium was 5.6 and high. She had evidence of liver dysfunction with a raised ALT 
a raised bilirubin and a coagulopathy. Her INR was raised at 1.6 and her albumin was 27. Her blood gas showed a metabolic acidosis with a lactate at 4.5 and her glucose at this time was 2.5. So what is the most likely diagnosis? We must first ascertain if this is an acute problem, which is the tables and figure on the left hand side, or is it a chronic problem? Then we need to decide is this pregnancy related or non-pregnancy related? Other conditions apart from acute fatty liver pregnancy include HELP syndrome in the third trimester. When we are considering differentials, I would like to discuss the clinical overlap of acute fatty liver with other diseases. If we start with this busy table, and on the right hand side, there is hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, HLH. Then there is HELP, hemolysis, raised liver enzymes and platelets. Then there is catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. Today I will not discuss TTP or sepsis, which may overlap with clinical features of acute fatty liver. I believe the diagnosis and therapeutic challenges faced at this time are really important to consider. If we think of HLH, it is a very rare condition. The true incidence in pregnancy remains unknown. It can either be primary or secondary. Primary usually is autosomal recessive disorder occurring in infancy and in childhood. During pregnancy, secondary HLH is probably more common and is associated with malignancy, sepsis and autoimmune disease. The diagnosis is made if you have five out of eight of the features that are present in the HLA 2004 classification of HLA. There are no established guidelines for the management of pregnancy related HLH. It can present in the antenatal and postpartum period. Renal failure is not common. Neurological presentations include seizures, coma, Platelets can be low and sometimes very low, less than 20. There is evidence of coagulopathy, deranged liver function test. And the management of pregnancy related HLH is very specific and is debated much in the literature and includes high dose steroids, anakinra and other medication and drugs that reduce the immune system and suppress it. HLH is more associated with a raised ferritin in the 10,000s and a raised triglyceride 2. If we consider HELP, which is more common in the obstetric arena and can ascertain 10 to 20% of the preeclamptics on, on occasion, it normally presents in the third trimester and postpartum. Three to 15% can produce with an AKI and they can have an eclamptic seizure. Platelets do fall, but not usually less than 30. One in five may have a coagulopathy and a deranged liver function test. Management is supportive and delivery will actually improve outcome as it is removal of the placenta that is helpful. Catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome is also very rare and is characterised by multiple small vessel thrombosis leading to multi-organ failure. It is associated with a positive APS screen and a history of previous obstetric losses, particularly miscarriages, in the first and second trimester. It usually presents postpartum and with an acute kidney injury. The platelets are normally not dropping 
However, there is evidence of coagulopathy and transaminase rise. Timely diagnosis and aggressive management is required for this medic disease. Acute fatty liver, I will discuss further and expand on this in the next few slides. If we refer to the diagram on the left hand side, it is suggested that the pathophysiology is due to the impaired mitochondrial beta oxidation of fatty acids caused by enzyme deficiencies. The fatty acid oxidation defects that have been associated include the long chain 3 hydroxyacyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase, LCHAD. Deficiencies in this enzyme result in accumulation of hepatotoxic long chain fatty acid metabolites. It is these toxic metabolites that lead to liver dysfunction and possibly in some cases, acute fatty liver or pregnancy. We will now discuss the epidemiology and clinical features of acute fatty liver or pregnancy. The prevalence is approximately one to three cases per 100,000. The figure on the left-hand side is from the UCOS study, a population-based descriptive study of 229 hospitals in 2005 to 2006. The study found 57 mothers had acute fatty liver pregnancy. There was one maternal death leading to a case fatality of 1.8% and there were seven deaths among the 67 infants born to the mothers with a perinatal mortality rate of 104 per 100,000. Acute fatty liver of pregnancy is more associated with multiple pregnancies, low BMI, and as discussed previously, in children with disorders of beta fatty acid oxidation. The diagnosis of acute fatty liver of pregnancy can be made based on the Swansea criteria, where if there are more than six of the following features, in the absence of another explanation, this is more likely to be acute fatty liver pregnancy. In our case, she was vomiting. She had an elevated bilirubin. Her blood glucose was low. She had evidence of a leukocytosis. Her liver enzymes were raised. She had an acute kidney injury and she had evidence of a coagulopathy. Now discuss the temporal profile of the disease. The graph on the left from the UCOS study found 75% of the women were diagnosed antenatally and 60% of them then delivered within 24 hours of the initial diagnosis. 25% of the women, the dark shaded columns, were of the postnatal women who were diagnosed with acute fatty liver pregnancy within four days of delivering. One in six were admitted to a liver unit. The second graph on the right reminds us of the post-delivery complications that are seen in acute fatty liver pregnancy. And I will discuss this further in the next few slides. Fulminant cases of acute fatty liver pregnancy are a multidisciplinary approach with supportive working and management of the patient. Early delivery, whenever feasible, should be carried out. And treatment that is required prior to de delivery may include reversing the coagulopathy and discussing this with our haematology colleagues with vitamin K, FFP, cryoprecipitate or platelets. There is now some data to suggest some evidence for NR-cetylcysteine in non-drug induced forms of acute fatty liver of pregnancy. And this can be used safely in pregnancy. 
it is also important to review and look for transient diabetes insipidus and symptoms of polyuria and polydipsia, which are common due to diabetes insipidus. This is due to an elevated vasopressinase concentration caused by the diminished production of the inactivating enzyme of vasopressinase in the liver. Therefore, DDAVP, an analogue of vasopressin, can be prescribed and is safe to prescribe during pregnancy. If we now consider an A to M approach to managing our fulminant acute fatty liver pregnancy patient, first and foremost is airway protection in case the woman is untunded due to encephalopathy. Intubation may be required. Her respiratory rate may be raised due to a metabolic acidosis and in view of her coagulopathy, two large bore cannula should be inserted as we may need to manage bleeding. It is important to remember that 70% of women with acute fatty liver of pregnancy have preeclampsia and blood pressure management is important, particularly if it's above 160 of 110 millimetres of mercury. Magnesium sulphate is used to prevent eclampsia and an infusion for neuroprophylaxis is necessary. Please remember that you can load with a normal dose of magnesium sulphate and then half of the usual infusion dose should be prescribed and given and a repeat magnesium level undertaken four to six hours later if there is evidence of acute kidney injury, as in our case. Common antihypertensive medication includes that we use are hydralazine levitalol and nifedipine MR can be used orally. When required parenterally, Hydralazine and libitol are both very effective. Hydralazine can cause the maternal tachycardia and it is important to ensure that the woman is adequately hydrated prior to administering hydralazine. Libitol can cause nausea and dizziness too. But both are very good to use. used to have a blood pressure of less than 140 over 90. Continuing our ABCD approach, if we look at D for diabetes and disability, remember that a woman who's pregnant can have a fasting of less of approximately 3.5. Anything lower than that is abnormal. So in our case, when she had 2.5, this is very low, and you can consider an infusion of 10 to 20% dextrose. E is for exposure. There is a very high risk of profound coagulopathy and risk of bleeding. So expose the patient and look for evidence of bleeding. F is for fetus and due to the metabolic acidosis, there is a high risk of fetal distress. And therefore, if there is evidence of this, appropriate timing and mode of delivery should be discussed and the risk versus benefits considered. A vaginal delivery may be more appropriate, will reduce the risk of bleeding. However, a caesarean section may be required due to fetal distress and therefore there should be forward planning to consider all of these aspects. Blood tests should be repeated every 6 to 12 hours and serial blood glucose measured every 2 hours to look for evidence of hypoglycemia. When we consider the outcomes of women with acute fatty liver, we, this is nicely summarised of these 10 papers of 447 women. As you can see, the caesarean section rate was very high in all of these 10 papers of 67%, and the fetal loss was very high at, at approximately 17.7%. The UCOS study is there. And what you can understand from this figure is that this is including the Western world and low-income countries, and hence the disparity 
in the numbers of maternal death and cephalopathy and renal failure values. So for the, in summary, for the management of acute fatty liver or pregnancy in the critical care, a thought should be considered pre-delivery, intrapartum and postpartum. Time-specific measures for pre-delivery include fluid status, blood tests and appropriate correction of coagulopathy, fluid balance, consideration for blood products later on, and monitoring whether non-invasive or invasive, and evidence of cerebral edema and, and intracerebral pressure due to encephalopathy. Intrapartum, it is important to consider analgesia during labour, hemodynamic management, ongoing fluid replacement, ongoing requirement for blood products, and uteronic agents. Postpartum hemorrhage and medication will be discussed later by Katie this evening. Postpartum, location for ongoing care is very important. Analgesia management and monitoring non-invasive invasive considerations. So my take home messages include the fact that we should always be working as a multidisciplinary team. Early recognition and timely delivery is appropriate for acute fatty liver pregnancy. Supportive care is paramount for multi-organ failure. And we must ensure and continue to build the links between maternity services, critical care, and our lower local low liver unit. Thank you for listening. I'll stop now. I would now like to invite Craig Katie Cranfield, who is a dual intensive care and anaesthetic trainee, to speak next. Thank you. My name is Katie Cranfield and I work at the RVI in Newcastle upon Tyne. Within the UK, we're privileged to have a relatively low maternal mortality rate of 9.2 deaths per 100,000 women. However, more than two thirds of these deaths are due to non-obstetric medical causes, as indicated here. Women who have died often have multiple health problems or other vulnerabilities. You're more likely to die in the UK if you're over the age of 35, of black ethnic origin, or three or more previous births during your pregnancy. It, critical care admission rates are similarly low within the UK, with a rate of 2.24 per 1,000 women for obstetric patients. This is likely to be a significant underestimate of the number of women requiring enhanced maternal care and a Scottish data set has suggested severe morbidity in 7.3 per thousand women. Critical care admissions are usually short for obstetric patients with 60% being discharged in less than two days. We've touched on the fact that women often share similar demographics to those found in Embrace Mortality Report and you're more likely to be admitted to critical care with preeclampsia, diabetes or placental disorder. Women are most commonly admitted to critical care due to obstetric hemorrhage or pneumonia, and we certainly go some way to preventing these so-called preventable deaths. But it does have a significant impact on women and families. Within the UK, women are almost always separated from their baby and partner upon admission. There are significant feelings of loss and grief around missing the baby's first few days of life, and worries about their own and baby's mortality. There are physical difficulties with caring for baby, difficulties in bonding, and families, particularly partners, are particularly affected and poorly supported. Families have found critical care follow-up particularly helpful. Even within a tertiary centre obstetric unit, the number of critical care admissions are likely to be low, and we therefore need to make use of all resources available to us to avoid relying on human recollect to provide good care to these women, whether that involves prompts, care bundles, guidelines not easily accessible. We also need to take into account the altered physiological parameters during pregnancy. We need to increase our MDT working and have daily collaboration with obstetrics, obstetric anaesthetists, obstetric physicians, midwifery staff and pharmacists. And also work regionally in MDTs through the new maternal medicine networks that are being set up. Women are 10 times more likely to experience a VTE during pregnancy and up to 25 times more likely to experience a PE or a DVT postpartum. We should therefore use a pregnancy specific VTE assessment and make sure that the prescription of low molecular weight heparin is appropriate. 
we need to consider the rhesus status of our patients and whether or not they require anti-D. And have an awareness of the enhanced maternal care guidelines. Do you, does your unit need to think about transferring level three patients to a different unit? We should potentially also be seeing these women in our post follow up clinics. I would argue that we don't always need to separate the whole family. If you have a large cubicle, an awake mother, and a well baby and father, perhaps we could look at caring for all members of the family together. We should certainly make sure we've got photos of baby nearby, encouraging clothing swaps with a muslin tuck between mum's breasts that can be swapped with one in the cot on a routine basis so that both mum and baby have something that smells of each other. Pregnant women should be nursed in the left lateral position and we need to try and include parents in routine neonatal care wherever possible, whether that's trying to make sure that nappy changing occurs on critical care or even baby checks up there. I'm not going to touch upon prescribing for breastfeeding within this talk, however I wanted to highlight the fact that we really should promote maternal choice with regard to infant feeding wherever possible and support women in the choice they make. That might be through your obstetric unit's infant feeding coordinator or link nurses on your critical care unit to support women who are breastfeeding. We should also make sure that we're actively considering breast care in all women who are feeding, regardless of the age of their baby or child. The last thing that we want is women ending up with mastitis. There are a couple of things that I wish to highlight when considering cardiac arrest in this patient group. The first is the importance of manual uterine displacement, and the second is the vital role that resuscitative hysterotomy plays in survival. While studies have found that 60% of UK patients who experienced an cardiac arrest during pregnancy survived, the medium time of collapse to hysterotomy in survivors was three minutes versus 12 minutes. My key message is really don't wait for obstetrics. This needs to be done at the time of collapse. Think ABC knife and certainly within five minutes. All you need is a scalpel and two clamps. It's a midline incision. And if it's not something that you're comfortable with doing, it may be worth seeking some simulation training from your obstetric team. You need to think about obstetric causes of cardiac arrest, such as hemorrhage or thrombus, either cardiac or thromboembolism. And in women who you're uncertain of the cause of arrest, consider an angio and PCI. 16% of maternal deaths in the last Embrace report were due to venous thromboembolism. Tachypnea, chest pain, persistent tachycardia and orthopnea are all red flag signs during pregnancy and should be appropriately investigated. It's a lovely summary of this in the acute care toolkit that I've highlighted below. A chest x-ray should be your first line investigation for shortness of breath and chest pain, potentially along with ultrasound scanning for a DVT if you're considering a PE. Don't use D-dimers during pregnancy, they're almost always raised. We should consider a point of care ultrasound in all maternal collapse cases and that should include an echo to assess RV function and a fast scan to exclude an intraabdominal bleed or an ruptured ectopic, plus or minus DVT scanning. If you're still considering a pulmonary embolus in a woman with a normal chest x-ray, a VQ scan should be your next um, line investigation as it carries a lower risk of radiation to maternal breast tissue. We've already touched upon the importance of an appropriate VTE risk assessment within pregnancy. Physiological shortness of breath of pregnancy generally gets better on exertion and it may be that exertional oxygen saturations can help you here. Cardiac disease is the largest cause of maternal death in the UK. You're three to four times more likely to have an MI during pregnancy or postpartum. DC cardioversion is safe during pregnancy and a number of women died as a result of delayed cardioversion. We really need to highlight the importance of considering both ischemic heart disease and aortic dissection in this group. And also the importance of a low threshold for ECMO referral, both for respiratory and cardiac failure. Overall, one of the key findings from the MPRESS report was the importance of making a positive diagnosis, not merely excluding cardiac or, th or pulmonary emboli. I know you will all be comfortable with managing major hemorrhage, but there were a couple of key differences that I wanted to highlight with obstetric hemorrhage. The importance of using measured blood loss rather than an estimated, as we're notoriously bad at assessing this. Considering whether or not your unit uses an obstetric major hemorrhage pack. Within pregnancy, women have fibrinogen levels of more than 2 grams per litre. In FFP, the fibrinogen levels are 1.5 grams per litre. And you're actually diluting a woman's clotting factors by giving her FFP. Our unit has no FFP in the first box and comes with cryo in the second box. The importance of uterine massage medications and potentially with trips to return to theatre to stop bleeding. Tranexamic acid is safe in this patient group, but particularly patients with preeclampsia, you do need to be aware of the risk of pulmonary edema and trali. Trauma is an aspect of um, obstetric care that we have very little data about at the moment, but we do know that there's an increased risk of domestic violence during pregnancy.
Decision making during trauma calls is often adversely influenced by the uterus and the baby. You should scan the patient and treat as necessary for mum. If you have a patient on a spinal board, the wedge should, should be placed underneath the spinal board, otherwise manual uterine displacement throughout the trauma call. And the role for early obstetric involvement and consideration of resuscitative hysterotomy if necessary. Overall, I wanted to highlight the importance of making a positive diagnosis. Your duty of care always lies with the mother and you should not delay key investigations because of the woman's pregnancy. This is a patient group that relies upon MDT working, both locally, regionally and nationally. And I strongly feel that we should use all available resources and prompts that we can. I'm therefore going to leave you with this list of resources to screenshot or use as you see fit. Many thanks. Hello, my name is Katie Scott and I'm a women's pharmacist currently working at St Thomas's Hospital in London. And this evening I'm going to be discussing prescribing in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Firstly, we want to discuss the prescribing principles in pregnancy. During the first trimester, drugs can produce congenital malformations and the period of greatest risk is from the third to the 11th week of pregnancy. During the second and third trimester, drugs can affect the growth and functional development of the fetus, or they can have toxic effects on the fetal tissues. Drugs given shortly before term or during labour can also have adverse effects on labour or on the neonate after delivery. When prescribing in pregnancy, we need to think of the risk-benefit ratio. Does the benefit of treating the mother outweigh the risk to the fetus? We follow some general rules that suggest using the lowest dose of the medication for the shortest period of time. Also, I stress the importance of utilising your ward pharmacist, whether that be your critical care pharmacist or your women's health pharmacist. Speak to them about these patients. Next, we will discuss pharmacokinetics in pregnancy. The absorption is affected due to decreased gastric acid secretion and increased mucus secretion, and this leads to an increased gastric pH. There's also a reduction in intestine motility and reduced gastric acid secretion, and these both can affect dr drug absorption and bioavailability. Many patients suffer from nausea and vomiting, particularly in the first trimester, and this may affect the absorption of their medications due to the, their potential decrease the amount of drug available for absorption following oral administration. Distribution is affected due to the change in total body weight and body fat, and there's an increase in extracellular fluid and total body water. And there's also a marked decrease in the albumin concentration. And the reduction in albumin concentration will affect drugs that are highly protein bound, for example, tacrolimus or phenytoin. Metabolism is also affected through the hepatic metabolism, particularly the cytochrome P450 enzymes, and their activity can be increased or decreased depending on which enzyme. Now, this is particularly relevant to drugs with a narrow therapeutic range, as the increased metabolism can lead to subtherapeutic levels and worsening of disease control. And excretion, there is an increase in the GFR with 50% higher within the first trimester, and this continues to increase during pregnancy. Therefore, there's an increased drug clearance in pregnant patients. Next, we're going to discuss the commonly used medications in critical care, as per this list. Any reduction in maternal arterial pressure can compromise uteral placental blood flow, leading to fetal ischemia. For this reason, the use of vasopressors and inotropes in critical care are so important. We know the vasopressors alter the uterine blood flow. However, the risk outweighs the benefit to resuscitate the mother. Our first line is noradrenaline. However, we also use adrenaline. It is a tocolytic, and that is a drug that is used to suppress premature labour and this can cause fetal dysrhythmias, but the use is well established in pregnancy. We use dibutamine, and this is used in combination with noradrenaline, and this allows for independent control at beta and alpha adrenal receptors. The use of milrinone, levosimendin, and isoprenaline, there is no published data, 
However, the benefit outweighs the risk. If the patient needs these medications, then we should use these medications. Vasopressin is a uterotonic. By that, I mean it is used to either induce labour or induce a contraction. And for these reasons, this is why we, it is not our first line. Many people are worried about sedation in the pregnant patient. However, we need to consider the risk-benefit ratio when we're treating these patients. Propofol is widely used and has a good safety profile. Midazolam is again widely used and there is a risk of neonatal withdrawal, but this is only after prolonged juice. Fentanyl is short-acting and is currently the drug of choice at my, my hospital. Morphine, uh, again, widely used. There is a risk of neonatal respiratory depression if used immediately prior to delivery. However, in the maternity context, morphine is our analgesia of choice in active labour. There is also the risk of neonatal withdrawal if prolonged use as well. Clonidine there it has a long half-life and there's a risk of accumulation which we need to be aware of. Analgesia in pregnancy. PCAs and epidurals provide good pain relief post-surgery and postnatal patients and pregnant patients are no exception. To discuss simple analgesia, paracetamol is widely used and considered safe in pregnancy. With regards to ibuprofen, it may be considered in the second trimester up to 30 weeks gestation if the benefit outweighs the risk. However, we avoid its use in the first trimester if possible, and it is contraindicated in the third trimester as it can cause the ductus arteriosus of the baby to close prematurely. Therefore, we would recommend, if necessary, to use the lowest effective dose for the shortest period of time, ideally two to three day course. Dihydrocodone is the opioid of choice for moderate pain relief in pregnancy and in breastfeeding. We avoid codeine in breastfeeding due to the unpredictable maternal metabolism, and this leads to the risk of overdose in the infant. We follow the RCOG guideline for low molecular weight heparins, and we use weight-based dose banding. And these are different to the adult guideline. Therefore, please be aware if you have an antenatal or a postnatal patient that you're using the correct guideline and the correct dosing of low molecular weight heparins. Low molecular weight heparins should not be given within four hours after a spinal anaesthetic or removal of an epidural catheter. Equally, catheters cannot be removed until 24 hours after treatment dose dalteparin or 12 hours after prophylactic doses. If a patient cannot have low molecular weight heparin, then they will need Flotrons or something similar. With regards to stress ulcer prophylaxis and prokinetics, PPIs, um, for example, pantoprazole and omeprazole and histamine 2 receptor antagonists such as ranitidine are all safe in pregnancy. And with regards to prokinetics, we regularly use erythromycin and metoclopramide in, in pregnancy and they are both safe. Commonly used medications in maternity. Fetal lung maturation is used in gestations between 24 plus naught and 33 plus six weeks. We recommend that you follow your local guidelines, but normally it is either dexamethasone or betamethasone that is used. The reason we use these steroids are that we know that they readily cro cross the placenta and we want it to pass from the mother into the baby so that it reaches the baby's lungs. As mentioned previously, uterotonics are used to help stimulate a contraction and are also used in the treatment of a postpartum hemorrhage. Oxytocin has a short duration of action and it is the preferred option in hypertensive patients. Ergometrin is very effective, however, it is contraindicated in cardiac patients as it can cause widespread vasoconstriction. Carboprost or Hemavate is very effective as well, however, its use is cautioned in asthmatics. Therefore, misoprostol tablets are a potential option and the oral tablets can be used either vaginally or rectally. Treating sepsis in pregnancy. Firstly, we recommend that you follow your local hospital antibiotic policy. 
With regard to therapeutic drug monitoring, such as gentamicin and vancomycin, we recommend that you use the most recent weight that you can for your patient. However, if this is not possible, then use the booking weight or the weight in early pregnancy. We avoid tetracyclines such as doxycycline in pregnancy, as it is thought that they can cause the discoloration of the child's teeth. There are areas with regards to pregnant patients, obstetric sites of infection that you should be aware of. And these include retained products of conception, chorioamniitis, endometriitis, pelvic abscess and wound infections. However, pregnant ladies can obviously still suffer from non-obstetric infections such as pneumonia and pyelonephritis and therefore will have to be treated for these effectively. Breastfeeding principles. Breastfeeding is beneficial to both mother and baby, so withholding breastfeeding should not be regarded as a no harm option. Many people are worried about medications and breastfeeding and tend to err on the side of caution and tell the mother not to breastfeed. We want to avoid this. Breastfeeding and skin to skin contact should always be encouraged. Milk should ideally be expressed at least eight to, ten, eight to 10 times a day. And this expressed milk can either be taken to the neonate or discarded as required. Breast milk needs to be stored in the fridge and it can be frozen. So utilize your local breastfeeding team or your midwives for their advice on your local facilities and storage options. We need to consider the baby, the mother and the drug in breastfeeding. What is the potential risk to the baby? Is the drug licensed in children? What gestation was the baby at birth and how old is it now? And how often is the baby feeding from the breast? With regards to the mother, is this medication essential for her? Was she taking it during pregnancy? Is this a chronic use or acute use? And what are her thoughts? If you can have that conversation, that can be very helpful. And with regards to the drug, is it licensed in breastfeeding? What is the pharmacology and the pharmacokinetics of the drug? If it has a large molecule, it's unlikely to pass into the breast milk. However, breast milk is fatty in nature. Therefore, if it's a lipophilic drug, it will want to move its way into the breast milk. You also need to think about the side effects and the contraindications of that drug. Let's discuss some drugs in breastfeeding. Firstly, opioids. They are present in breast milk. Therefore, we recommend to monitor the infant for any opioid type adverse effects. This includes sedation, slowed breathing rate, constipation, and is the baby gaining appropriate weight? Low molecular heparins are compatible with breastfeeding as they are unlikely to transfer into milk in clinically significant amounts and are not absorbed from the infant's GI tract due to the large molecular weight. Antihypertensives are very commonly used and the following have no known adverse effects on babies. This includes levetolol, atenolol, metoprolol, nifedipine, enalapril and captopril. Antibiotics are generally well tolerated, however they can disturb the baby's gut flora, therefore there is the potential for GI side effects. Of note, metronidazole can affect the taste but this is not a reason not to use it. Laxatives, including lactulose and the macrogols, are compatible with breastfeeding as it is unlikely to be absorbed orally by the mother. Senna, short courses are compatible with breastfeeding as there is anecdotal information that suggests that there can be an increased case of diarrhea in babies. If you need to suppress the lactation of one of your patients, there is two ways of doing that. Firstly, there is the prevention of lactation using cabergoline one milligram as a stat dose, and this is on the first day postpartum. If it's any other day, then you need to use the suppression of established lactation protocol, and this is cabergoline 250 micrograms twice daily for two days. This slide is some information sources with regards to pregnancy and breastfeeding and I believe that concludes the presentations and we will be moving on to the Q&A section.
Thank you very much to all our speakers. These were excellent presentations and it's certainly lots of useful information for us all. I'd just like to remind everyone, if you've got any questions you'd like to ask any of the panellists, please pop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, as we now have some time for a discussion. So I wanted to start off by asking um, about the role of the critical care outreach team now that we have a maternal national early warning score and whether you, what the role really will be of the critical care outreach team in managing obstetric patients. That's maybe a, a question for me to answer, Sarah. Or, or have, uh, well, thank you. Um, well, it's, um, it's early days for the national score, as far as I'm aware. We're going to try and get some basic score by the end of the year. Um, I'm so delighted. It's uh, Tony Kelly, the head of patient safety for maternity, that set this up. Um, but it's no mean task getting everyone together. Um, as we all know in obstetrics, um, it's, uh, it's um, going to be quite difficult to get a consensus. But we are fortunate in that we've had um, a good uh, evidence-based paper recently by Peter Watkinson at Oxford giving us um, really solid ideas about where our thresholds should be for all the variables we look at. Um, so that's going to really give us a, a hand to get this up and running. And maybe next year, we'll, well, hopefully next year, we'll have something practical. As regards critical care outreach, I'm very hopeful that this will link in. Um, I'm not sure how that will work, um, but it would be um, a shame to miss out on the experience of all of you guys with your new scores. Um, with all the electronic systems, rapid response systems that you have. So I do hope that um, the critical care outreach will play a big part, but at the moment, I'm not sure how it's going to work out because it's still early days. Can I add some things? Um, I think we've, I absolutely agree with Audrey, but I'd also like to say that actually, if we look at COVID and we saw and understood how critical care outreach suddenly changed, um, when they had to look at respiratory rate and oxygenation, even in non-pregnancy world. And when they then came into maternity, understanding the nuances and working together. So I think this is a great opportunity. I think the learning from this COVID time in the past four months across the country will actually give more buy-in because usually what happens is, depending on which hospital you're working at, or the critical care have very close links or what happens is that they're just not there. They don't turn up there because either the patient, the woman goes to ITU or obstetric anesthesia are looking after them so closely. So I think the bridging will occur and this is very, very timely. Can, can I just make one more comment? Actually, I didn't get a chance in, in the, the talk, um, but there actually might be some funding streams as well, which is always um, very important coming from the enhanced care document. Um, now, it's very early days with that as well, but if we can get ourselves organised in maternity and shown that we have good enhanced, enhanced maternity care s systems with midwives that are, are trained, getting any training, working with critical care, big units may have both critical care nurse and midwife looking after sick patients, the money uh, potentially is there uh, according to the enhanced care document. So that, I think that's a very exciting area and something we should definitely try to exploit as well. And that's for training patients and uh, training staff mainly. Thank you. So we've had a question on the Q&A section about the role of oral anticoagulants and their safety in patients who are breastfeeding. I wonder if you could give us any more information about that. Sure thing. Um, so with regards to um, DOAC and breastfeeding, currently, they are we are saying that they are contraindicated and if you needed to um coagulate a patient who would like to breastfeed um we would tend to just stick with warfarin just now um there is um some patients that have breastfed on other um, doacs and um i need to correct me if i'm wrong i think it is a dabigatrin is the one that we might go for that we've got the most information for there is one doac um, but currently we are still suggesting our patients stick with the warfarin because we know that that is safe with breastfeeding. Thank you. And I have another question from Wendy Pollock about um, are you aware of any high acuity midwife liaison roles? We certainly have a midwifery staff at our unit who uh, work 
uh, are trained in enhanced maternal care competencies and then spend periods of time up on ITU and working with the outreach team. Um, in our unit, all of our core delivery suite staff have those competencies, but I don't know what it's like in other units. I don't know, Audrey, what it's like for you. We have, um, we've based our competencies on the, the national document, enhanced care document, um, and our critical care nurses uh, sign off the midwives that rotate when they start. Uh, they have a six weeks rotation to ICU and recovery. And then the, the, the more experienced ones will, I nearly said older, uh, the more experienced ones will rotate and refresh as well. Um, but it's, so it's still a big struggle getting time off, getting funding for the midwives to leave um, the, the maternity. So that's where really funding is going to make all the difference, I think. Yorkshire and Humber are ahead of the game. They've benchmarked all their maternities. Um, and I showed you very briefly a slide of a critical care educator there, but they have got a, a competency package that will be signed off for every unit in the region in some format or another, depending on different sizes, how many they, they sign off, but they have got a formalised competency training package, which is great. Excellent. Um, I just wanted to touch on, Katie, you mentioned uh, the role of ECMO and how that we shouldn't be frightened to refer patients who may benefit. I'm just wondering if anyone has any experience about a referral process or any outcomes for patients who have required uh, treatment with ECMO? I suspect that Anita is more experienced in using ECMO in pregnancy, but we certainly, our referral unit is Leicester and every time that we've contacted ECMO at Leicester about non-pregnant patients, that they have always been brilliant and the, seat, the referral process has been seamless and we get all of the help that we need from them. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Katie. Thank you for that. And can I add that, so what we've learned from Embrace and what we learned about from ECMO is that we need to know where the units are for your maternity unit. And the message, the mantra should be to refer early. So don't wait until everything's gone too wrong because that's harder for everybody. Um, we we ha also do have a large ECMO unit. We had ECMO during pregnancy, during COVID, and we, we normally have probably one to three women th um, on ECMO every year for, for the past few years. Um, the reasons being mostly are post postpartum or, um, because they've delivered and then the, the woman has come. But I think the mantra should always be talk to them early, talk to your intensive care colleagues, reach out to them because the conversation should be there so that every woman has an opportunity and, and it's not left until too late. Thank you. And then I was also wanted to touch on the role of follow-up. We know how important it is to try and get patients who've had a critical care admission into a follow-up clinic but I have no personal experience of any obstetric patients going through this process and just was interested on anyone else's experience of this and how we can perhaps improve this across the region? I don't think that many units have funding for it, if I'm completely honest. We're seeing patients in a non-funded way and um, there are other ways that you can perhaps, we've involved the obstetricians with screening questionnaires and it would be amazing to have a dream post follow-up clinic to be able to see everyone. What I would hope is that maternal medicine networks and maternal medicine centres might identify these women who've been really quite unwell and have more of an MDT working an MDT follow-up and we all provide more holistic care to these women um, but I think that's something that's very definitely underfunded at the moment and I think ITU follow-up clinics in general are very underfunded nationally at the present. Just a comment Sarah I'm just hoping we can maybe jump on the Covid bandwagon here uh, we've had lots of equipment and, uh, and funding um, there's a huge problem ahead with the COVID rehabilitation in general and certainly looking at the papers on pregnant women having COVID with post-op delirium, post-recovery problems, rehabilitation, postnatal depression. There's a um, myriad of problems out there for, for these groups uh, added into the COVID population. So we may well find that there will be uh, some, some, some funding and resources available and we need to push, I think, as always for the obstetric side as well. Absolutely. Can, can I add to that? So we do have a postpartum ITU follow-up that happens, the intensivists do it. And normally, because we do have uh, myself and Kathy as obstetric physicians at Guys and St Thomas's, if there's some, a communication or something needs to be moved along, we, we will 
join in and support this. It doesn't happen smoothly. It needs to happen better. But I think there is an opportunity here and it should definitely be part of the maternal medicine networks. But I think um, COVID has taught us with our COVID um, ITU women that they really need the support. If you're torn away from your baby, you, you're in all of this PPE, the, the, the aftermath of this, I think the next six months, we're going to see more and the more support we can give and we can really reach out is going to be absolutely necessary. And get the, get the GPs involved as well, because sometimes you're transferred to a unit that you're not familiar with, you're out of area, then you suddenly go back to your hospital. And that can be really, really difficult because nobody knows the whole story. So I think this is a great opportunity for us, again, to work with and the perinatal mental health, general practice and intensive care, bridging that communication for maternity. Thank you. So I've had another question from Nat Linda on the Q&A, who's a midwife working in a small unit who's trying to improve a enhanced maternity care and is wondering about any particular links or resources which might help her develop the service. Can I, can I start off with that one? Um, obviously, if she, she'll, she'll know the Competencies uh, Enhanced Care book that's got some ideas about training and linking in. And um, there are various um, training techniques around the country, but she's certainly very, um, very welcome to contact myself and I'll give her the, the um, training package that we have for, for our midwives in, in Middlesbrough. Um, and linking in with your local critical care team uh, is the best resource, I would say, for her to get off the ground. And I have another question then about um, patients who have liver disease in pregnancy and about intrauterine transfer, how this would be coordinated and would this be interregional and who might be involved with this and how we could develop this service as required? A very good question. Um, I'll start and then please Katie and Audrey um, chip in. So again, a bit like um, the ECMO centres, there are only X number of liver units across the country. And so again, as from a trainee point of view, I think, and from a nursing point of view and a midwifery, always know wh where, where do you go and um, where is your PAMI? Wh where is your liver unit? Where is your neurosurgical unit? Because once you know that, it's much more easier. And then I think it's buy-in. And I, the most important thing, is once you have somebody with a liver condition, reach out to them earlier. They may not want to transfer, but what's good about reach, reaching out is that they start discussing the same patient on their board round as well, because it's on their to-do list and on their kind of um, helicopter view. So I think we should be developing them and be part of that. And I think that's a really good idea as we develop the maternal medicine networks to ensure that the ECMO centers, the liver units and neurosurgical units we have maternity as a much smoother buy-in um, with ITU. I think it's not necessarily um, a, a straightforward answer for each patient because liver units, neurosurgical units aren't necessarily in the same sites as tertiary obstetric centres. Um, it's very much looking at each individual patient and what is their priority at that time. Obviously, there needs to be collaborative working throughout but deciding the right location for mum baby and what the priorities are at the time is going to change for each patient and it might change throughout the course of the pregnancy and what might be the right location for them at one point in their pregnancy or postpartum period may not be the case at a later date and I think that it's been great that we've had more zoom meetings more Microsoft team meetings because actually everyone can see each other everyone can get to know each other and you can work more collaboratively on a, a regular basis discussing the patients and this is a, the sort of thing that should be discussed at the networks at the, the maternal med, med networks maternal critical care networks where in the, this region is are you going to center you've obviously got your liver units which is quite straightforward but other maybe more complex respiratory problems who's going to be uh, putting themselves um forward or who's going to be the obvious place to go and take these patients and which centre shouldn't sit with a pregnant woman with respiratory failure for three days. Uh, so we're supporting each other with good good links, good pathways and 
and actually hopefully through some of the technologies that we're using now that will be become easier actually I, I, I hope it will the paediatric side is, is fairly well organized and I've been aware of that recently we have a, a thing called Nectar in the northeast um, for paediatric transfers and I don't see why we can't pinch some of their ideas and why we couldn't do something similar in obstetrics it's really really a, a great idea and it should be happening around the country yeah absolutely Thank you. And then I just wanted to ask one final question. So we're becoming aware of how important simulation training is, that we don't work individually. We have to work within the multidisciplinary team. And perhaps to obstetrics, this is even more important because we're bringing in uh, people who may not traditionally be involved with critical care. I just wondering if anyone would be able to comment on courses around the region um, or ways that people can get involved or get training set up within their units. Can I share this? Because this is um, very London centric, but we are trying to get it across the country. So um, simulation is, is one part of learning. And what we've developed in the past five years is a course which is 50% technical and 50% human factors, because it, knowledge alone never really re resolves everything. How we communicate, how we prioritise, how we share information is absolutely necessary. And the more simulation we can do, and they don't need to be big high fidelity simulation. Simulation in the sense of transferring a pregnant woman from your obstetric unit to ITU. Simulation in your ITU um, pregnant woman suddenly um, having a postpartum hemorrhage or going into premature rupture of membranes and having to deliver. And I think we need to start with this aspect. Simulation is a big part of education. So from a trainee point of view, it should be there and it should be paramount for anaesthetists, obstetricians, physicians, etc. Multidisciplinary, we need to develop that through maternal medicine networks and also share what's out there. So I, I know that in, in London, we, we have the, um, mem the memo course that we've been running for about five years. We've had about 400 delegates through it and we run high, we run high fidelity simulation for about 15 people at a time. So, so it's, it, it's, it's labour intensive. But more important, what I've learned during COVID is that you can do um, more lighter fidelity and low fidelity and share information because you have to decide what, what is your objective? Is it a system problem? Yes. And understand what your system, how your system is improving. And then team working and how do we develop that? And I think anaesthetics and intensive care have always been very good at that. But it went up, what I've learned from the, uh, the course that I've been running now for the past five years is when I have an intensivist, mm -hmm. I have an a &E doctor. They say, you know what? You put me in a &E, I'm okay. When you take me to the maternity unit, I, I feel different. I feel different. And that mm -hmm. perception of feeling different, you're all smiling because we all feel that way. And I think we need to unpick this because um, there's already good learning. And I think we can strengthen that. I'm very happy to share the stuff I do in South in London with all of you so that we can really develop this in a, in a really transparent way. Um, but but I, I feel very strongly that I think simulation is one part of, of learning. Yeah, I agree with you entirely, Anita. It can't, it's not going to go away now. We, we will get better as COVID, um, you know, we, we get some sort of treatments, but that's obviously not going to happen for a, for a, a while. And uh, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to come up with new innovative ideas like we yeah. have with the other things. Um, we are using some uh, systems with ma wearing masks and being one meter apart but I can't imagine not having it we have to keep doing it we've all been uh, turned upside down and thrown into this COVID world and we've all managed to make uh, good of it and, and we've all done simulation training throughout this as well so uh, simulated training um, so I'm sure we will continue and, and maybe come up with even better ideas but we need to share it and that's good. Yeah. so good if you can share we need to just work out ways of disseminating information and more of an openness, I think, to, to, to doing that and, and, and learning from each other as well. So the, the future might be, might be bright in some ways, although it's definitely challenging. And well, I think that probably draws our webinar to a close this evening. I want to say thank you to everyone who's joined us and a massive thank you to all our speakers for some really excellent talks and a great discussion. Please join us on the 27th of July for our COVID-19 Research What Have We Learned webinar. And also have a look and subscribe to our Intensive Care Society YouTube channel where you can catch up on previous webinars you might have missed and then you'll be able to find a copy of this one in a few days time. So thank you very much everyone and good night. You too, Sam. Good night. Bye.